Um, I'm going to uh, introduce our panelists, then I'm going to invite each of them to make uh, two-minute opening remarks. Um, I, I've got a very scientific method for choosing who goes first. Uh, an email was sent to me with people's names on it, and I'm just going in that order. Uh, and then we'll go in the same order at the end, so whoever um, went last uh, uh, at the beginning will get to, to sum up at the end. Um, then I've got a, a number of good questions that have been provided to me by uh, Community Foundation and, and the library, um, and I'm going to offer them to the, to the panelists and have them each take a turn, another two minutes, answering each of those questions. I'll probably throw in one or two questions of my own. Starting at 7.45, we're going to, uh, assuming we have some with this intimate group, um, we're going to take uh, questions from the audience and proceed from there. Um, and then at the end, uh, a little bit after 8 o'clock, I'll invite you all to make some closing remarks. So our panelists are, we have here Nathan Ballantyne, who is a member of the South Carolina House of Representatives, representing District 71. We have Matt Moore, who's the executive director of the South Carolina Republican Party. We have his counterpart, Amanda Loveday, executive director of the South Carolina Democratic Party. And we have Bakari Sellers, who is also a member of the House of Representatives, representing District 90. And I'm going to start with Matt. We're not actually seated in the order I'm going to go in. But Matt, uh, give us your, your two-minute take on this election and uh, start us off. Well, thanks for having us tonight. We sure appreciate it. And uh, a lot of respect for Amanda and Macari, obviously, even though we're uh, opposite side of the aisle. And Nathan as well, uh, been a longtime friend. But uh, this election, we think, in the Republican Party uh, presents two really stark choices uh, for the direction of the country, uh, a fork in the road, if you will. Uh, on one hand, uh, four years of uh, lethargic economic growth, uh, leading from behind foreign policy, uh, and, and melees across the country. Uh, it's evident in the polling you see now, uh, I think uh, Governor Romney's first debate woke people up uh, out there in the country and, and they've seen that uh, we can't have four more years of the, of the last four years. Uh, these, these last two debates, uh, with Governor Romney and President Obama, uh, probably more a, a tie more than anything, but uh, of course you see the polling play, uh, playing out across the country right now that it's a dead heat and uh, we're gonna wake up in two weeks uh, on election day and not really know uh, who, the, who the president will be, and that's a, that's a neat thing. It doesn't always happen that way. Um, of course, we think Governor Romney is uniquely qualified to be president. He's got a long record of uh, service and achievement, uh, not only as governor in Massachusetts, but in saving the Olympics, uh, in being a really strong business person, he understands how the economy works. Uh, I think if you watched him at all, need these debates recently, um, he has a, a really coherent vision for where the country needs to go, and uh, we think he's a guy to lead us there. All right, thank you. Amanda. Thank you again, Brad, for having us. And it, it's definitely an interesting thing to be a Democrat in South Carolina, but I think that it's very important to, to hold on to your values and your beliefs, um, no matter whether you're in a red state, a blue state, or a purple state. Um, I find it very interesting that, that Matt says that Mitt Romney is uniquely qualified, because I'm pretty sure we sat at a similar table um, about 10 months ago, and he said Newt Gingrich was uniquely qualified when he won the South Carolina primary. Um, but what we have here is, is a president who, who was delivered and given a, a horrible situation in our economy. Um, he has done the best he can. Uh, yes, he hasn't reached all of his goals, but he's reached a lot of them. Um, when we make goals in our personal lives, we, we hope to only hope to reach 50%. I know that I don't always personally do that. So I think that it's good and, and, and important to remember that the president was handed something that was not the best situation and had to make the best out of nothing. Uh, something that's very interesting over the last three debates is, is yes, absolutely, we saw Mitt Romney come out in the first debate, and, I'm, and I definitely um, am not going to sit here and tell you that the president did his finest job at the first debate, but I wasn't sure last night if I was going to see Governor Romney endorse the president or just endorse some of his policies, which we saw. Um, so when, when November 6th comes around in two weeks, I think that the voters around the country um, I never say that, never say never, that we will never vote for a Democratic president in South Carolina. Um, but when voters go to the polls in two weeks, I think that, that they will see that we need four more years um, to, to 
close up the unraveling that happened for eight years under George Bush rather than give it back to George Bush's policies. All right. Nathan? Thank you, Brad. Uh, thanks, Russell and County Library and the uh, council for having us here. Uh, I know each of these individuals, I, I know some better than others, but uh, you'll find hopefully tonight that we can disagree without being disagreeable. Uh, and that's something that I've long looked for in politics. Uh, I've been in office eight years, and uh, while I'm very uh, considered very much a fiscal conservative, uh, in the state house chamber, uh, I'm not a hyper partisan kind of guy. So, I, you know, if I throw some zingers here tonight, it's only because I'm getting them. <laughs> uh, I guess I would start with what Amanda just said uh, about the president. He's doing the best he can, and that's why we need. Uh, thank you. And that's why that's why we need to change. Um, I supported uh, Governor Romney the last cycle. I thought he was the right man for the job then. Uh, I think the country would be in much better uh, situation uh, than we are now. Uh, had, had we chosen him as Republicans, but we didn't. We went with McCain, um, and that ended up very, very badly for us in November. Uh, Matt had already mentioned that this is going to be a very tight race. Um, it's, it's such a cliche in politics that every vote counts. Um, you know, you heard Amanda, it, South Carolina is going to go for Governor Romney. I think most people know that. Um, but there are very critical swing states and, and quite frankly, counties that, that are going to decide this, much like it did one of the elections back down in Florida. So um, it is my hope that Governor Romney can continue this momentum now that everybody has had a chance to see his, not only his vision, but the type of man and character he has, as well as uh, how he handles himself. Uh, it, the debates are, you know, a lot of junkies like us, we live and die and we watch them all the time. Most people don't. But I think if you call it the debates, the first one, it, it, we couldn't really figure that one out. That was obviously, I think, much in, in Romney's favor. The last two, you know, everybody sees what they want to see in that, and that's what politics is about. Um, I thought last night, I thought both, uh, well, the president and the candidate, Governor Romney, did very well. Um, and I thought it, what, what intrigued me mostly is how the president was, was a little bit more attacking, a little bit more aggressive. Um, you win debates, you score points by doing that, um, but it also showed me that, that I believe their uh, campaign sees what everybody else sees, and that's right now the momentum's with Governor Thank Romney. You. Thank you, Nathan. Mr. Sellers. Um, I, I want to echo the same sentiments as some of my colleagues and just say thank you for being here. Um, it's a privilege and a pleasure to serve with Nathan and um, also uh, work with both Matt and Amanda as we try to move this state forward. Um, I think this election actually poses, to, to go back to what Matt said, I think this election actually poses uh, three uh, very clear choices. Um, you have a president who's running on his record, um, you have a Mitt Romney who's running for president, and then you had a Mitt Romney who was running for the GOP nomination. So you clearly have three different individuals in this race. Um, you know, as, as for leading for behind, this is the first time in this country in the past decade that we've actually had a president that's improved the United States' global stature. Um, the world looks at us differently. Uh, we're no longer, um, and, and I, and I kind of take umbrage to, to uh, Mr. Moore's comments about leading from behind, um, because we're not. Uh, we actually have respect throughout the world, um, whether or not we're talking about Israel, which we can get into, um, or whether or not we're talking about the Middle East and Osama bin Laden and taking out the leaders of al-Qaeda. Um, as for the polls, I think that everyone in here understands, and I'm sure I might as well go ahead and take this bullet away from Nathan and, and Matt, but they're going to, you know, tout these recent Gallup polls and these recent polls of uh, likely voters across the country. And I think everyone in here is a learned group, and we all understand that one, likely voters don't really include those who just voted in 2008 for the first time. Um, and two, their nationwide polls where we all understand the president is losing in the South by 22 points. Um, so they're not an accurate reflection of where we're going. I feel very confident um, in the outcome uh, on uh, two weeks from today and I suspect that the president will have uh, four more years. All right, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna start out with a gossipy one. Some of y'all alluded to last night's debate, but uh, I wanna invite y'all to just kind of, we've, we've had our last look at uh, both of the candidates going head to head. Um, we're two weeks out. Um, I'd like to hear y'all talk about where you think the race is now after last night. And I'm gonna start with Amanda. Thank you. Um, I think that a lot of us have kind of talked a little bit about where the race is today. And like Nathan said, the, the debates are, are really for junkies. I would say like everyone in this room is interested in politics. Um, but I think after last night, they, they saw a, a leader. They saw a commander in chief in the president. They saw someone who has, has, has had experience in foreign affairs, has had experience in foreign policy and spoken to foreign leaders and, and, and made decisions that maybe not always be popular. Um, 
I, I, my colleagues to my right made a lot of jokes last night on Twitter specifically saying that the president threw Vice President Biden under the bus for saying he didn't support um, going after bin Laden. But it's just, it shows the type of president that we have, someone so close to him and a, and a very close confidant. Even the president said on the trail today that Vice President Biden is the first person he goes to to make a decision. And if someone so close to him said, I don't think this is a good idea, and the president thought so wholeheartedly that it was the best idea for, for not only our country, but um, for the individuals who told stories about last night who lost family members in 9-11, it proved that he's a leader, um, that he's gone out there and been able to prove that he can lead this country forward and not backwards. Um, he's also has a proven record. Um, like Bakari said, it's very important to, sh to see that we have two different Mitt Romneys. Um, I'm not sure which one you guys are going to be for Halloween, but you have many to choose from. Um, and so it's, it's very hard to see which president or which Mitt Romney would be president if he were to win. And so I think that's what's so really important for people when they go out to the polls is that you know what you're getting with Barack Obama. You have no clue who will show up at the White House in January if Mitt Romney becomes president. Matt. And that's the exact problem. Uh, we know who we're going to get in Barack Obama. This is a guy who... Uh, today, he put out a 25-page glossy policy agenda that's just rehashed ideas from the past four years. It took, uh, to this point in the campaign, with 14 days to go for them to put out a coherent policy, and it's not even coherent. It's, it's a bunch of rehashed ideas from the past four years. And Amanda mentioned leadership uh, under the president. Um, you know, this is a guy who last night repeatedly talked about uh, polling issues uh, to find out where he stood. I think that was kind of uh, uh, the line he used. Uh, that's not leadership, and I think that's, that's where Governor Romney uh, differs with the president. It's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a clear difference in terms of um, a, a clear conscious and a, and a clear mind and, and a clear uh, picture of where he wants the country to go. Um, and, and I think the takeaway last night from that debate was that, you know, this maybe seems silly to say to non-political junkies, but substance rarely wins debates, uh, you know, style all too often, maybe unfortunately wins uh, debates. Um, but what we saw throughout this, this whole debate cycle for the past month or so is that uh, Governor Romney not only won on, uh, we think, the style, but on the substance too. I mean, the first debate you saw, you know, a seven, eight, nine, ten point jump in the polls. Um, and, what, and Representative Sellers uh, mentioned uh, the polls, and he's right. It's, it's, it's going to come down probably to, uh, to Ohio. Uh, Representative Ballantyne mentioned that too, certain counties there. And, uh, if you don't win Ohio in this race, uh, you've got a big problem um, because uh, especially Governor Romney's path really narrows to winning. Uh, if you don't win Ohio, you've got to win uh, probably Nevada, Colorado, Iowa, New Hampshire, maybe one more state as well. So if you look at it one state on election night uh, before you go to bed, uh, check out Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Sellers. What was the question? <laughs> to, uh, this, Man, I listened to you two. I forgot what the question was. Yeah. Is that good? Or bad? I don't know what you was. I was all over. I was all over the place with you guys. Okay. Goodness, I was all over the place. Like Mitt Romney's foreign policy. Um, we'll just we'll just go directly into it. I, I think that this election is intriguing. We've we've been talking about choices, and uh, we've been going through these debates. And I think that our country in 2012 forward, we're in some interesting times. And um, we had an Arab Spring. Um, we find ourselves with uprisings across uh, the globe. Um, we find a, Iran and Syria becoming threats to um, our greatest ally in the Middle East. And when we talk about these things, I, I think that it's almost laughable um, that my good friend, Mr. Moore, and others, they always go to Mitt Romney's ability to rescue the um, Winter Olympics as foreign policy experience or some experience that can help him govern uh, many of the challenges that we face today. Um, you know, I'm not one of these people who want to necessarily talk about um, the negatives or, or, or going to the, these negative tantrums and that we oftentimes go into when we talk about our, our opposing colleagues. So I, I want to highlight some of the things that we can talk about that Barack Obama's done. Uh, whether or not it be on the economy or whether or not it be on foreign policy. And I know I only have a few minutes left, a few seconds left, so I, I think that we'll save that as we get further into the discussion. Uh, All Mr. right. Wood. Mr. Valentine. You, you know, it was interesting, and, I, and, I, and I'm not picking on you, Amanda, but you just say good stuff and it gives me something to think about. She talks about the tough decision that the president's made. You know, I don't, I don't think anybody would say it was a tough decision to, to, to take out Osama bin Laden. 
Uh, you know, the, the tough, de I don't think it's a tough decision for people to grow entitlements and just give out handouts and say, you know, here you go. Now, I understand it's, it's to help people and, and, and there are people that do need help. Um, but I tell you what tough decisions are, and that's, that's when an elected official has to say no. Uh, you know, I wrote about this on my website many years ago. My, my job would be much easier in the General Assembly if I just said yes. Everybody comes wanting something, wanting money, wanting this, wanting that. Just say yes and get, you know, you don't have to worry about any kind of stress. But if you, if you really want to, to, to think of concern, whether it be for the future or other things of that nature, you've got to say no sometimes. I thought it was real interesting when um, Governor Romney, I was surprised, quite frankly, when he picked Paul Ryan uh, to be his VP. Um, I thought that was a gutsy move. That's something, I mean, I'll never be in a position to make that call, but I, I thought that was something that was gutsy. And that basically said, look, as Republicans, we're serious when we're talking about, okay, there's the one minute thing. I need to start paying attention to that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, as Republicans, we are serious when we, we're talking about entitlement reform. Now, the Democrats are going to paint us throwing grandma off the, the cliff, and that's not what we're doing. But what we're doing is we're going to have to say no to some things now in order to make it thrive later on down the road. We'll talk about that later, I'm sure. Nathan sells himself short, by the way, saying he can't be president at all. <laughs> it's, a high, um, it's a height requirement. As we, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have Leo. As, we, uh, <laughs> as we proceed, I, I want to go ahead and uh, thank the panelists for thus far being far more respectful to the format and to the moderator than any of the presidential <laughs> vice, presidential, <laughs> vice presidential candidates have been. We're seeing a lot of maturity here tonight. I do expect you to call out Representative Valentine and Matt when they lie, though. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I want to add something to our format. If, after we, we go through all four of you, if one of you all want to rebut something, just raise your hand, and, and I'll give you a minute, if, if my timekeeper can help me with that, OK? Um, uh, that way, we, we can have the, the back and forth. Um, the national unemployment rate in September was 7.8%, while South Carolina's unemployment rate was 9.1%. How would your candidates' economic policies put South Carolinians back to work? And in my effort to have somebody else go first each time, I'm going to ask Mr. Sellers to start us off. I think that's a good question. I'm actually glad to get that question first. I think what you saw today was in Ohio, you had certain parts, especially of central Ohio, where you had unemployment rates dip down to 5.6. Um, and I oftentimes examine our, our labor statistics here in South Carolina, and you oftentimes ask yourself that very simple question of, of why. And, I, and I'm not sure that Matt Moore or Nathan Ballantyne, I'm really not sure that Glenn McConnell and Nikki Haley and Bobby Hero can answer that question of why South Carolina's unemployment rates are higher than all their neighbors. Even during this economic depression, if you look at Georgia, if you look at North Carolina, if you look at Tennessee, they all have lower unemployment rates than South Carolina. And what that fundamentally tells you is that for the last decade in South Carolina, it's been a decade of lost leadership. The Republican Party has driven us off the fiscal cliff. And, and I love how my good friend Nate Ballantyne talks about saying no, and, and you can oftentimes say no and say no, but we've become to the point where we've been obstinate. And when you have people like Mick Mulvaney, when you have people like Tim Scott, when you have people like Nikki Haley that are preventing growth in this state, that is when it becomes a problem. So what Barack Obama has to do is work with people in a bipartisan fashion, just like he did with Congressman Jim Clyburn and just like he did with Lindsey Graham, to make sure that the port has the funding that it needs to expand. I mean, if we're going to succeed, then Barack Obama has to continue to do the things he's done, which is work not with, oftentimes, Jim DeMint or Nikki Haley or Joe Wilson or any of these people, but in spite of their efforts to stifle growth in South Carolina and still bring the necessary dollars here and invest in infrastructure, invest in education. You look at Dillon High School as a prime example. If it was up to Jim DeMint, there would not be a new high school. There would not be the Build America bonds that rebuilt the school in Dillon, South Carolina. And I think those are prime examples of what we can do in the next four years, investing in infrastructure, investing in education, not with South Carolina's leader, not with the South Carolina Republican Party, thank, thank but in spite Mr. of Sellers. them. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ballantyne. Um, you know, I can tell you exactly what uh, a President Romney would do that's different than president that we have now, is he would work with South Carolina outside of, I will give credit about the port, and I'm, I'm appreciative of that. I thought that was a very interesting move. Uh, considering some things that have gone on inside the state and some pushback, but you know, particularly we're dealing with jobs, and, that, and, and that's what the question's about, unemployment and jobs. I mean, we, we've had to, Boeing wanted to move here, and Washington was not gonna let them do that, 
And so we had to fight to bring those jobs to our state. We do not need a president that's gonna always be fighting with the states. There are states' rights. Now, I would, I'm not a far-right individual, but a lot of things I believe in, they're the local closest, uh, government closest to the people is best. Um, uh, President Romney also with education, and, and, and I agree with Representative Sellers. We've got to work on our education system. Now, there's always different ways to get to where we want to go, and we always, none of us have a silver bullet, but Governor Romney believes in choice, as I do. I represent Lexington Dist District uh, 5 here in South Carolina. We're one of the best districts, us and I believe up in York area. Uh, but there's other people along, you know, the corridor of shame. Those kids should not be trapped in those schools just simply because of their location and their zip code. I think Governor Romney would help with education, which education goes hand in hand with jobs. Ms. Loveday. You know, I think it's really interesting that Representative Valentine brings up education when we talk about jobs in South Carolina, because if it weren't for the Republican leadership in South Carolina with Nikki Haley and Mick Zais, um, we would have gotten over $70 million of federal funding for our education system in South Carolina. We were the only state that turned it down. Um, that would have produced jobs, that would have, that would have helped the corridor of shame. Um, but instead, the Republicans here in South Carolina decided against it. And I think that's the number one thing people need to realize. When we talk about states' rights, when we talk about things that are close to home, as important as the president is in this election, as important as the president is um, in our daily lives, our governor is probably even more important. Um, the president isn't here when we're passing budgets, and the president isn't here when we're talking about um, you know, bringing a company to South Carolina or, or making more jobs. Um, as Representative Seller said, we are 44th in the country in unemployment. All of our neighbors are above us, and there's no excuse for that. Um, the problem is, is that we have a government that has been solely um, represented um, and, and absolutely uh, taking control uh, of South Carolina, and that's the Republican Party. Ten years ago, our unemployment was in the single digits, and just throughout the past decade, we've seen it rise and rise and rise. And it's not for anything other than the fact uh, that they're worried more about lining their pockets and making sure that they are, are getting what they need um, and maybe what their districts need and not so much about the, the general public in South Carolina. So when it comes to issues in, in South Carolina, we need to look ourselves in the mirror and look at who we're voting for on a local level when you go out and vote for your state house or state senate races or county council races for that matter. Um, because Barack Obama's not here when we pass our state's budget and he's not here when you and I are applying for jobs. Ms. Moore. Uh, we'll start kind of nationally first. I mean, the, the numbers don't lie about the past four years. I mean, uh, you know, 23 million Americans looking for work. Yeah, unemployment uh, is down below 8% now. I'm, I, that's great. But if you look at why, uh, the underemployment level uh, is still above 15% uh, persistently now for, um, I think, about 48 months. Uh, so all the numbers you may see the Democrats or President Obama touting in terms of job growth just because people have given up. And that's a sad place uh, to be in. Uh, you know, the number of people on food stamps uh, is, has uh, grown by about 50% to about 45 million. It's unacceptable. Um, and, and I think maybe where we, we diverge uh, as a party, uh, and maybe as a nominee versus the president, uh, is on, you know, that path and, and, and how do we grow the economy the right way. It, one, it begins with lifting the red tape on, uh, on businesses. And Representative Valentine mentioned uh, the, just the fight that the NLRB put up against Boeing, and they wanted to open up a non-unionized uh, plant factory here uh, in South Carolina. So that, that's somewhat indicative to me of uh, the, the problem with a, a president who doesn't want to work with a state. You know, he, this is the president who said no four, you know, there, there are no red states and blue states, we're all these United States. Uh, so a little hypocritical there. Uh, a couple of points uh, here about, about here in South Carolina, how we are the economy. I mean, this is a, this is a, a state where 100 years of Democratic control uh, led to all of them being kicked out. And you can't blame, uh, you know, that, you can't blame what's happened over the past 10 years without looking at <laughs> 100 years of, of just uh, the, the, the reason they were kicked out. Uh, across the South, too, that uh, the party ran out of ideas and that they trust uh, the Republican Party overwhelmingly on, uh, on growing and protecting small businesses. So, I heard a lot of stuff. I can't remember all the things that were said, uh, but certainly 600,000 you know manufacturing jobs have been lost in the past three and a half years. And you heard the president say in the second debate, you know, those jobs aren't coming back. Um, you know, the way we grow this Thank economy you. in terms of Thank you. We'll, we'll talk some we'll more about the economy. Okay? But, but Brad, if I may, can I? Yes. Can I, let, Go ahead. Let's minute. just let's correct a few things first. 
the Republican Party, they like to talk about NLRB when it comes to unions, but the first thing they do not tell you is the key fact about NLRB and, it's, and how it's created. It's an independent organization. It's not as if the president wakes up, picks up the phone, calls NLRB and says, we're going to shut down Boeing. So that's factually inaccurate. That's pretty common. You want to talk about numbers don't lie. Well, we talked about the numbers. And one thing that you nor Nathan had the ability or just the unwillingness to address is the simple fact that South Carolina's unemployment rate is higher than all of its neighbors, even though we're going through the same economic depression slash recession. And, and I find it laughable. Also, I, went, I went Joe Biden on you and just had to break out in laughter how you actually had the audacity to sit here and blame it on the people who came before you instead of owning the problem. Because when we talk about the eight years before President George Bush, I mean, eight years before Barack Obama, which was George W. Bush, then you throw that in our face and say, we can't do that. So let's not hear about the hundred years before. Let's actually hear about the last 10 years. Let's hear about Mark Sanford's failures. Let's Thank hear you. about Nikki Haley's Thank you, failures. Mr. Sellers. Thank you. Is there a response on this side to that? One I doubt it. <laughs> well, let me go on to another economic question. Small Business Administration lending in South Carolina reached a record high in 2012. How are your candidates' policies creating an environment in which these and other small businesses can succeed? Let's start with Mr. Ballantyne. Well, you got to look at the track record that Governor Romney has. You know, um, I'll go back to foreign policy. All of a sudden, the president, who was a community organizer before he was elected, is now the, the king of foreign policy. So we're, we're taking shots at Governor Romney, who actually did more than being a community organizer as far as a foreign policy type perspective. So let's look at the businessman. Let's look at what he did in, uh, in, in Massachusetts and everybody knows up there. Here's what, what, I, what I agree with my colleagues across the aisle. Whoever is our next president, and I hope it's a new one obviously, but whoever that individual is has got to work across the aisle. And that, and that could be said here locally in South Carolina as well and in politics in general. Governor Romney had a legislator that was 80% Democrat, but he got stuff done. Uh, and that's what you're gonna have to do. When, when President uh, Obama, when he was first in office, the first two years, he focused on Obamacare. He didn't focus on jobs. He had the keys to everything. He had, he had the Democrat chambers, didn't do what I thought and what many of his, his own party thought should have been done is let's get jobs, you can worry about that legislation later. What will Governor Romney do? He believes in the free market. Now I know to a lot of people that sounds like a bumper sticker that Republicans put on our, our cars during campaigns. But again, it goes back to, <clears throat> you cannot be there to bail out everybody. It goes back to the auto industry. He caught a lot of grief for that. You know, he didn't specifically say let them go bankrupt. That's you know how the newspapers work. Somebody did. else writes the headlines there. But you're going to have to have the free market work. You're going to have to let businesses learn. They're going to fail at sometimes. They're going to succeed at others. Uh, Governor Romney's a businessman. He has turned around businesses in the past. He'll turn around America. This is love day. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting because Governor Romney did actually say those words that he would have let Detroit go bankrupt. Um, and I think what's also important is, is yes, no question it's important to make sure that businesses understand what it means and, and when you are doing something that causes you to fail that you need to learn uh, the repercussions of that. But, but what the president did and what's fortunate for having President Barack Obama in the White House when the market crashed was that if we would have let them go bankrupt, not only would we have lost millions of more jobs, um, but we would have absolutely gone into a, a worse depression than we saw in the 30s. Um, it's funny, whenever we talk about jobs, they bring up Obamacare uh, because they have nothing else to say. Um, but th the president said this at the convention, and I'll, I'll repeat it, is that I'm happy with the term Obamacare because Obama does care. Um, and, and in Obamacare, there is a, there's a... Um, a line in there that, that gives tax cuts to small businesses, because I'm pretty sure that's what this question was about. Um, tax cuts to small businesses that offer health care um, when they have five or less employees. Um, that allows them to give health care to, the, to these individuals who normally would not have been able to get health care. Uh, I mean, I'll use the state Democratic Party as an example. We have six employees, um, but we offer full health care benefits because that's the right thing to do. Um, not only are they working their butts off, especially right now, um, but they should be given the same opportunities and the same um, chances that anyone else should get, whether they're a teacher or whether they work as an engineer. Um, and to be honest, if it weren't for tax cuts like that, organizations like mine and like Matt's, who, who are small, would not be able to offer opportunities like that to, the, to, to their employees. So that's something to really remember when you're looking when it comes to small businesses is how important Obamacare has, has been um, to, to small businesses, especially ones that are they're five or under. Um, 
and going back to the auto bailout, we have to remember that when the when the president was handed, I'll stop. We're gonna have I'll to let Bacar talk again. about that another time, um, <laughs> Mr. Moore. Uh, a couple points about Obamacare. I mean, one is that it's a huge uh, burden on small businesses. I mean, about a trillion dollars of uh, of tax increases. Uh, in rating of, of Medicare to pay for it. And how that helps small businesses, I don't know. If the president has spun it that way, and so will Amanda and, and Representative Sellers. Uh, but but to obviously taxing small businesses more and rating Medicare to pay for it, uh, probably not the best way to, to go about uh, making the Medicare system uh, you know, sustainable long term, uh, but also you know, not punishing the small businesses. Um, you mentioned tax policy. And the president uh, is seems, uh, we're in the family atmosphere here, he seems heck bent on uh, raising taxes on a vast majority of, of those people who are who are filing their taxes, uh, you know, it's ten ninety nine partnerships or those kinds of things. Uh, you know, the vast majority of small businesses here in America aren't corporations. Uh, they don't get uh, you know tax at the high the high level. Uh, the corporations get taxed relative to the rest of the world, but uh, they, they get taxed just like you and me uh, as salaried people. So uh, the president seems to confuse you know the two, and that's where that's where Governor Romney I think has a better plan. Uh, to allow those small businesses to take home more money instead of taking more out of their pockets. Uh, you know, last point about education, about growing the economy. Uh, you know, no one can deny here in South Carolina that we, we need to do better on jobs. That, that, that remains true you know, nationally as well. And, uh, and the president in the second debate, what I tried to mention earlier is that the president in the second debate mentioned that those, uh, those manufacturing jobs aren't coming back. Well, you know, he may or may not be right, but what we need is more uh, skilled workers, the kind of workers that work at Boeing, that work at BMW, that work at Bridgestone and, and Lexington County, uh, and, and make things that, that Americans are uniquely qualified to make, uh, high quality, high value things. So the choice that Representative Ballantyne mentioned in education matters. Uh, we need more uh, technical high schools. We need more uh, school choice to allow those workers to get on the paths uh, they need to be on. Uh, because right now we've got companies who, who are desperate for workers. Thank you. Mr. Sellers. Thank you. Um, you know, my, my colleague said a few things interesting, and I'm just going to try to touch on as many as I can in two minutes. Um, the first is uh, Nathan Ballantyne attempted to, to allude to Mitt Romney's record in Massachusetts. Um, Mitt Romney's down 20 points in Massachusetts, and it's a state that knows him best. So I think that actually is indicative of his record. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Ballantyne also referred to the fact that Mitt Romney turns around businesses. Well, in South Carolina, we know what, we know what that means, because he actually, Bain Capital came in and invested in two businesses and two corporations in South Carolina, and he turned them completely around. They're shuttered now. They went from flourishing to shut down. So they were completely turned around. My colleagues like to talk about Obamacare. And they like to mention this uh, huge bill that passed in its first two terms. And I'm, you know, I, I, they always talk about this burden on small businesses and things of the such. And I think it's, it, it's almost amazing to me that in one interview just three weeks ago, after running 18 months of, about the first day he would repeal Obamacare, uh, Governor Romney sat there and said that there are certain parts of Obamacare I'm going to keep. You know, I, I'm going to keep most of this plan. And then last night he reverted back to, I'm going to repeal Obamacare. So I'm not sure where he stands on that. But I will tell you that without, uh, w without uh, excluding uh, people with pre-existing conditions for coverage and providing for, for prevention and things of that sort that are in um, Obamacare, as we call it, I, I don't believe that to be a burden at all. I think that uh, just a couple of other things quickly. Um, rating Medicare was a point that Mr. Mr. Uh, Moore said. Um, we're not rating Medicare. In fact, the, the, the governor's running mate tried to turn Medicare into a voucher system. That would end Medicare as we know it. That would effectively throw grandma off the cliff. There we go. I was, had to get that on. <laughs> Predicted. And then lastly, and I'll, and I'll, I'll end on this because I'm sure my time is running out. Matt, I, I would pose this question to Mr. Moore. He talked about the uh, governor's plan for creating jobs. Well, what is that plan? But you talked about it. Well, um, actually, Mr. Ballantyne asked to rebut. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I'll call it, instead of Obamacare, I'll call it the Affordable Care Act. Thank you. There we go. I got the formal name out there. I mean, and, and I think Mr. Sellers would agree. I mean, here locally, sometimes we have bills that come on our desk, or particularly dealing with the budget. We'll go to lunch. The Senate will amend a bill. We come back after lunch. we got to vote on it. And sure. we're like, are, are you kidding me? We've got 30 minutes to figure this out, you know? In that same vein, and, and I'm not going to bash this because I want to get to something important to South Carolina relating to the Affordable Care Act, 
But in the same vein, I mean, the bill was like 2,000 something pages and it was, you know, let's vote for it so we can then tell you what's in it. And that's not how anybody should work in business. We shouldn't do that in state government. I'm not saying we haven't done that. We do that often, likewise at, at the national level. Let me tell you that at a, that a debate that Representative Sellers and my, my, uh, self are gonna have to have. Uh, Y'all remember the stimulus debate several years ago. We're gonna have a similar debate now um, and that's gonna be dealing with the Affordable Care Act. And I, I don't wanna take up too much time, but this is an educated crowd. I wanna give them a little more so they can take back and share their friends because this is coming down the pike when we get there in January. There's gonna be a, a conversation and I'm pretty sure I believe our governor and, and uh, uh, Tony Keck are gonna wanna opt out uh, of the Affordable Care Act. And let me just, I'm gonna sum it up in numbers for you. There are 170,000 South Carolina women. That's right? your minutes up. I'm sorry. That's all I get. Okay. I'm going to give you all good stuff. We got anyway, we'll, come back. we'll come back to it. All right. Um, to uh, change pace a little bit, I'm, I'm going to ask one more question from the, the, uh, the list that I have here. And are the, have any questions come in from the audience yet? Okay, you do have some? Okay, well, I'm going to go ask, I'm going to ask one more from my list here, and then you can pass me those, and we can start moving to those. Um, let's talk about foreign policy a little bit. South Carolina is home to thousands of military families. How will your candidates foreign policy plans affect the men and women who serve in our military and their families? And I'd like to start with Ms. Loveday. I think it's really important to remember that the core uh, of the economy here in Columbia and that is absolutely Fort Jackson. Um, I think a lot of times we forget that they're there, and and you know we absolutely should should give them as much at all of our respect. Um, but I think the most important thing about the foreign policy experience between President Obama and Governor Romney is that President Obama has some. Um, I will recite what Representative Seller said about using the Olympics as foreign policy experience. I might take some of that if the Olympics had been in a different country that year. Um, but it was in Utah. Um, so he didn't travel far. Um, and again, no foreign policy experience in Utah, though some who've traveled there may disagree. Um, but I think the most important thing when it, <laughs> that was a lot of delayed, delayed reaction, sorry. Um, but I think the most important thing when it comes to the foreign policy, and we learned this last night, is that we have a president who has a plan. We have a president who has implemented a plan over four years, who has taken down um, the, the most sought out after uh, terrorist in, in the world um, with Osama bin Laden, and he should absolutely uh, be congratulated for that. Um, but then we saw Governor Romney, who congratulated and, and agreed with the president on, uh, I would say, 80% of what he said last night, um, which proved that the governor doesn't have a plan of his own and proves that when he gets into office, if he gets into office, hopefully he will not, um, but if he gets into office, that he will show and prove to the American people that it, it's just a little, it's a little immature. And the most important thing to remember is when the president went overseas when he ran four years ago, he was, he was beloved. Um, I even think John McCain ran a commercial and made fun of him for it. Uh, but when Governor Romney went overseas as a candidate in 2012, he was pushed out so quickly. Um, there were so many negative articles about it that, that it proved that he, if he can't- Thank you, thank okay. you. <laughs> You're Miller. harsh, Brad. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm way harsh. God, you need, need to talk to Jim Lair. <laughs> I've seen how these things can get out of hand. <laughs> Mr. Moore. The next governor's debate, we're going to have uh, Brad there. My no name. kidding. He, he keeps it on track. Um, you know, I think uh, a couple points to make here about South Carolina. I mean, two, we have no better advocates for our military here in South Carolina than Joe Wilson and Lindsey Graham, uh, both respected nationally uh, across party lines and their understanding and leadership on, on military issues, especially Senator Graham. Uh, his frequent trips overseas. Uh, I think even our Democratic friends here would agree that Senator Graham is, a, is a, an expert on foreign policy. Um, Senator Graham has recently uh, unleashed uh, some scathing criticism about uh, you know, President Obama's foreign policy. Uh, you heard Amanda here saying uh, the President has a plan. Well, what is it? I don't think anyone, the President or anyone in his party, uh, including our friends here, can, can sum up for you in one, in one paragraph what exactly his foreign policy is. Uh, and that's really the problem. And, and, Sure, I understand last night the Governor Romney may have agreed with the, the President on some things, but I mean, who, can, who can disagree with killing Osama bin Laden? 
or uh, using uh, you know, tactics to take out some of these, these awful terrorist leaders. I think the difference for Governor Romney, it's a difference in style. I mean, this is a president who uh, repeatedly has short-sighted, um, has short-sighted uh, Bibi Netanyahu in Israel. Uh, the UN meetings uh, two months ago in New York, he skipped out on David Letterman instead of meeting with uh, world leaders. He sent Hillary Clinton in his place. So it's not the kind of foreign policy uh, that, that Mitt Romney is certainly going to go after in the next four years. Uh, and, and, and the most, I mean, I mentioned this uh, here, here in South Carolina, is uh, sequestration, you all heard that term, it's a really technical term, but it just means cuts uh, to the military. Uh, we think sequestration could be disastrous uh, for South Carolina, and uh, our delegation in Congress, our senators, are going to fight tooth and nail uh, to, to, to prevent those cuts to our bases here in South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Sellers. Thank you. I, I want to answer Mr. Moore's question directly, um, unlike they did on my last question. But um, what is the President's plan when it comes to foreign policy? And I think we have some clear answers. We understand that the deficit we face in this country is high. It, it's, it's raging out of control. And the reason that it is is because we paid for wars on credit cards. So the first thing the President did was he ended the war in Iraq. He brought soldiers home. The next thing he's going to do is end the war in Afghanistan by 2014. Those monies, those dollars we save from ending these wars, we use to pay down the deficit. So that's a part of the plan. The other part of the plan is to no longer put military boots on the ground when we don't have to, ask Gaddafi. So then we go, we go to Osama bin Laden, which of course someone actually had to pull the trigger, and I'm just happy the President was there um, to do so. Um, I want to talk about Israel briefly, um, because I'm not sure if anybody else on this panel has at, actually had the opportunity to, but I actually went and met with uh, one of the Deputy um, Prime Ministers um, in Israel, um, and, and I've actually been to Jerusalem, I've actually been to Starot, the, the small city in the south of Israel that the President referred to last night. Um, and I've actually gone to the border of Syria, I've gone to the border of Lebanon, I've actually looked over and seen the Gaza Strip and looked over and seen West Bank and understanding the terror that kids grow up in in Israel, I've actually witnessed that. I can't say that I live it, I can't even say that I empathize because I can't stand in those shoes, but I can sympathize and understand those tasks that they deal with on a daily basis. And the unique thing about that is our President does too. He's made the greatest investment in Israel than any president's ever made. The $3 billion that they have for the Iron Dome is something that Israel and Bibi Netanyahu, regardless of whether or not they meet, they talk all the time, is very, very grateful for. So I think it's disingenuous to talk about the president's commitment to Israel. Lastly, like many of these people up here, I think that our country is weary. Um, I lost many classmates of mine in war, just like we have all lost many of our friends in war. And I think our country is weary. And the last thing that we want are Bush driven foreign policy, which I'm afraid we'll get if Mitt Romney's elected. Thank you. Mr. Ballantyne. Yeah, Brad, I've never served in the military. My, my father was on the small river boats in Vietnam, and, and uh, he's just recently in the past few years opened up a little bit about what goes on over there. My so was mine. We'll have to compare no, notes. <laughs> my, uh, my grandfather was in World War II. I have great respect for our military. And, and again, that's who doesn't have respect for our military? It's just the, the way that you go about approaching it. You heard Ms. Loveday uh, talk about uh, how he was well, uh, the, the president was well received uh, when he went overseas. Well, of course, because they sense weakness. Uh, they, uh, they sense that it's not going to be a strong America. You, you heard last night, frankly, I was disappointed in the, in the condescending tone, and I get, we, we throw out barbs, I get that, but I don't expect that from my president or, quite frankly, from a presidential candidate. You heard the comment about the, what was it, the horses and the bayonets and things like that. Um, we, we have got to lead with strength. And when America is strong, people will not mess with us. They will not even think about our embassies overseas. Um, that, I'm not going to rehash that. I'm not going to get into was it act of and all that kind of stuff. The bottom line is people are picking on America, and that has to stop. And they're going to pick on us until they see a difference and a strength. And I think Governor Romney is committed to that. Sequestration, I was pleased the President said it's not going to happen. I think they walked that back real quick quick last night and today, but if that happens, that will devastate South Carolina. We've got some F-35s down there in Buford as well, of course, Sumter, Shaw Air Force Base, and here Fort Jackson. We cannot have cuts to the military. That would be devastating here locally at the Palmetto State. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take one from the audience here. Um, here's one that's, uh, I'm, I'm being totally biased here. Here's one near and dear to my heart because I'm not overly fond of either one of y'all's parties. Um, <laughs> I don't know anything about Gary I, I like the individuals, not the party. Brad Worthen.com, I'll tell you all about it. That's right. Um, our current government is ineffective because of partisanship. Our leaders have lost the art or desire for compromise. The president has not been successful in overcoming this problem. How will that be different in a new term, either for him or for Mr. Romney? 
And let's start with Matt. Well, look at where Governor Romney has come from. Massachusetts, a state that uh, when he was governor, was 20% in the legislature Republican. Uh, this is a, a person who worked with them to get things done, uh, to lead uh, with distinction there. Uh, people there say good things about him for the most part. Of course, they're Democrats that, that don't. Uh, but, but this idea that, that, that America is pol more polarized than ever before, I, I don't buy it. I mean, you look at some of the presidential elections in the 1800s. Um, I mean, they had, um, you know, a duels and those kinds of things. They hated each other. Uh, but I would say uh, the biggest difference between our party and the Democrats right now is an unwillingness of the Democrats uh, in Congress and in the executive branch, the, the president, to look at our problems as uh, potentially leading us down the road to being like Greece, especially on debt. Um, Representative Sellers said earlier that uh, the money saved uh, from the war will be used to pay down the debt. Well, that's not what the Congressional Budget Office said. They said that by the end of President Obama's second term, potentially, that the deficit will be $20 trillion instead of uh, $10 trillion when he started. Um, so we've got to make some seriously tough choices. Uh, and I'm hoping the American people uh, you know, next spring, uh, no matter who the president is, quite honestly, uh, we'll finally stand up to Congress and say, look, deal with these problems before it's too late, because it's, at some point it could be too late. Mr. Sellers. Mr. Sellers. I, I, was, I, was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking about the 1800s, and I was going to come up with something <laughs> witty about the polarization in the 1800s, and all I could think about was Tag Romney saying he wanted to punch the president, and we talk about the discourse and the polarization coming from the, but that's neither here nor there. That's um, a good way to put that in there, though. I know. I had to, get, it was I had good. to go deep. Um, you know, one of the most amazing things about this political time we live in is that we have this unique fad. We have this fad that Matt has embraced. We have this fad that my good colleague, Representative Ballantyne, sometimes really, really wishes didn't exist. It's called the Tea Party. And the most amazing part about this fad that is, that is, that is causing a lot of hardship in, in D.C. is that it's very loud. It's very vocal. And we have that dichotomy right here in South Carolina. And it's so interesting to watch. You have true statesmen who will reach, reach across aisles and come up with great solutions and ideas to some of our country's most dramatic problems, like Lindsey Graham. And then you have the polar opposite. And it's amazing. They're on the same side of the aisle. And it's the polar opposite. And Jim DeMint, who's the forefather or godfather of the Tea Party movement, who will do absolutely nothing in this state's best interest. So I mean, when you look at, the, when you look at that, and you see within the Republican Party's own rank and file, you have this huge separation. It's like you have, you have people who are willing to work together to move this country forward. And don't get me wrong, on our side of the aisle, we have some relatively obstinate fellows Nancy too. Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'll give you that. However, I think that in the, in the, in the United States uh, House of Representatives after 2010, it's unlike any other time this country's seen, albeit I'll give you the 1800s because I'm not sure about that. But I think that ho hopefully, and this, is, this goes on both sides, hopefully we, we go back to the point where we, we start electing people who came into office like Jim Clyburn, who came into office like Lindsey Graham even, who were Carol Campbell and who were Dick Riley. And what that means is that they were statesmen first. And what we have gone to is we have gone to Mick Mulvaney. That, thank you, Mr. Sullivan. I can stop on Mick Mulvaney. <laughs> 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 Mr. Ballantyne. Well, I, I think, um, I don't think, I know that uh, my colleague, Representative Sellers makes some good points. Um, and it, partisanship is, is what uh, blocks a lot of things. Um, you know, a lot of people get on uh, my candidate, Governor Romney, you know, when they're asking for details of plans and things of that nature. And, and, and as you can tell, you don't have a lot of time when you're in a debate to lay that out. <laughs> um, one thing that I believe uh, in, in conversations I've had with him and, and uh, not just Governor Romney, but I would say uh, Representative Sellers and myself, is that in politics, it, it cannot be my way or the highway. Uh, anytime I draft a bill, I draft a bill, you know, here's how it's going to start, but I know I'm going to give on X and Y and it's going to get to this point. And that's how you have to do it. You have to have input. You cannot say, here's my bill, don't ever change it, sign on to it or don't, I'm going to ram it through. Um, we are a center-right country. I think we always will. Um, Representative Sellers mentioned the Tea Party. I was honored to receive an award from them. Um, but, you know, there are some things we disagree on. You know, they called me up and wanted to uh, start a Tea Party caucus here in the uh, General Assembly. And I said, okay, guys, hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm a Governor Romney fan. Y'all aren't big on that. We have, well, Nathan, we understand. Okay, Amazon, I was for jobs for uh, uh, Richland and Lexington County. Y'all weren't big on that. Well, yeah, I know. I said, okay, well, if we can understand and not focus on 20% and work on the 80%, just like Bakari and I, Representative Sellers and I, 
You'd be surprised. We actually agree on a few things. I'll surprise him and his party sometimes. He'll surprise me and, and my party. We've got to work together. There's extremists on both parties, and, and that is harming our country, as well as local and state politics. All right. Ms. Lovedale. Hey, can, I, can I just make one comment, Brett? A 30 let's, seconds. Let's let Amanda I, I, have her turn. No, I thought you already went. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's let her have her turn. It's the war on women. Again. Oh, God, I don't know. <laughs> always. I hope someone gave a woman question. I always I do that do those really well. Um, I think the most important thing to remember, and I'm absolutely not calling out the two representatives sitting up here with me, is that unfortunately our elected officials care more about their reelection than they care about the American people. Um, when they're sitting there voting on a bill or not voting on a bill or, or holding out on something so something doesn't pass or time runs out, um, they're not thinking of their neighbors. They're not thinking of their constituents. They're thinking about who will not give me money because I, I voted for this or who will not vote for me because I voted for this or didn't vote for this. I think the, the prime example of that was in 2011 when we were when the SMP said we are going to lower uh, the country's rating if you don't raise the debt ceiling. And we literally took until three days before it was, it was going to be too late to vote on it because people were scared. People were scared about what their constituents were going to say when they were up for re-election in, in 2012, just a year later. And I think that's what's sad is absolutely, Representative uh, Ballantyne is absolutely correct. There are extremists on both sides, but we have to, and I, love, I really like his example about giving a piece of legislation and knowing that it's going to change before it gets voted on, um, but being okay with the fact that it's going to become more of a bipartisan issue. And I think that that is what's so important for the American people and for constituents. You have to call Representative Sellers, Representative Ballantyne, and say, this issue is important to me. And we really need you to go out and either vote for this or support this or don't support this um, because it means a lot to me and it means a lot to my family. And, and, and here are the reasons why. Um, as, a, as a party employee, we send out a lot of emails and say, call your representatives or tell them to vote for this or tell them not to vote for this. Um, you know, we wouldn't have ETV here tonight if, it, if we allowed the governor to get away with cutting them every year. And I was an ETV employee for four years, so that's very important to me. And it, it really was a social media phenomenon that got them back in the budget um, because people went out there and said, ETV is important to me. And it's not just Big Bird. There are a lot of things on ETV um, that went out okay, and said thank you. that's important. I've got two requests for rebuttal. Mr. Sellers first. Mine's not really a rebuttal. Um, as much you just as want another, two, another minute, huh? Well, yeah, I, just wanted, I, like, I like hearing Go the right echo ahead. from my voice. Um, I think that there are very, very good people involved in politics today. Um, I always tell people all the time, people ask me what's my greatest frustration sometimes, and I say that being in politics is a lot like being in the ministry. And the reason is because people expect more of you than they expect of themselves. And I think that sometimes it's an it's a awesome task that you take on. I, con I consider Representative Ballantyne my friend, just the way I consider Ralph Norman my friend and others. But when we talk about this polarization, when we talk about the fact that we just cannot get to a point where we can move this state forward together, that's when we actually have some trouble to go to the root of your question. And my greatest frustration with our new generation of congresspersons, with, uh, I will leave Trey Gowdy out of this because I, I have a great deal of respect for what Trey's doing in Washington, but Jeff Duncan, Mick Mulvaney, Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, Jim DeMint, is by saying no to absolutely everything without giving any wherewithal, Thank you. You, you are hurting the state Thank of South Carolina you. and the country. Thank Ms. you. Mr. Moore wanted a minute. I was going to agree with the first part of Representative Seller's statement, but there are a lot of fine people in politics, both on the uh, Democrat and Republican side. And I don't want to paint them with too broad of a brush, uh, but you know, all of them care about you and they care about their families. It's just they, they disagree on how to get uh, to that point we all, we all want to get to. Yeah. All right. You too. Well, all right. Well, go right ahead. Well, no, I mean, I thought this was interesting. I can remember one of my first <laughs> years in the General Assembly, and uh, then, uh, then Representative Haley was my desk mate for six years, and there was an individual, she's no longer in the gen General Assembly now, but she was up there talking about a particular piece of legislation. And I turned to uh, then Representative uh, Haley, and I said, how can, I don't get it. How can she be so different? And it was, it was Bessie Moody Lawrence. And so uh, Representative Haley says, Nathan, she's a female. You're a male. She's African American. You're white. She's from a rural part of South Carolina. You're not. She's a little bit older than you. You know, it's it's greatly different. And uh, to that point, everybody goes to represent their districts. But I tell this is what I tell. I've, I've talked to two groups today, and I told them this is the same thing. As a House member, 35,000 people have an opportunity to vote for me. 
but I'm supposed to be representing over four million South Carolinians. And so sometimes, as Ms. Loveday says, we've got to step out there. We've got to press the button sometimes. It might not sit too well back home, but it's for the greater good. And we got to have more statesmen, and I consider Representative Sellers one. Again, I told you he'll vote with us from time to time. We've got to continue to do more of that. Another question from the audience. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Sellers. College students are graduating with thousands of dollars in debt. What can be done to relieve the burden on those struggling to pay back their loans and for future college students? That's a, that's a great question. Thank you so much. I, um, I'm someone right now who personally has $113,000 worth of debt. That's just from going to a private school and going to the University of South Carolina School of Law because I wanted to have my piece of the American dream and make my parents proud. And you know, I had those opportunities. And when I think about that, it's twofold. When I think about that, it's very personal to me because I look around and I go to college campuses all the time and I understand that a lot of people would, would not be there if it wasn't for Pell Grants, which is on the chopping block um, with Mitt Romney. I think about the fact that college now has become a luxury. It was a point in time when if you had the grades and you had the ambition, you could go to college. That's all you needed. Well, that's no longer the case and it will be exacerbated um, under of President Mitt Romney. And to go to just the heart of the question, um, to answer what can be done about that, I think one thing that happens now is whether or not you have a pro professional degree or a juris doctorate, whether or not you have a master's degree, they're just they're not job opportunities. And what we have to do as Democrats and Republicans is make sure that we're bringing jobs to the state of South Carolina. And I'm not talking about jobs that pay a minimum wage, I'm talking about jobs that pay a living wage. And the way that we do that is we invest in infrastructure. We invest in higher education. And one thing that Mr. Moore talked about earlier, and I'm glad we came back to this, is we don't, we don't bring the type of jobs we want to us because we don't place that value on education. And one thing that we do that breaks my heart every year is we underinvest in our technical college system here in South Carolina. The Republican Party in South Carolina has taken millions and millions of dollars out of our technical college system, which is our job training center here in South Carolina, or centers in South Carolina. So it, it's, a, it's a two-fold question, and I wish I actually knew the, the perfect answer for that question. But as I write my check every month to Sally May, and I write my check every month to the South Carolina Student Loan Company, I just pray that someone in the White House looks out for me. Thank you. Ms. Ballantyne. Well, I think one of the things we do here locally is we fully fund the, uh, the lottery scholarships. We have to continue to do that. You know, unfortunately, um, that scholarship doesn't go as far as it used to. Now, I, uh, we have lobbyists come talk to us all the time over there in the General Assembly, and I have talked with some of those in the higher education community. So they're always asking for money, and I get that. And, and quite frankly, we, they're, they're not even state supported anymore. I mean, I don't have the numbers, but they have to do so much with tuitions and, and things of that nature. But I asked one one time, give me a figure we can give you so you won't raise tuition on our kids. Just give me that figure. And we're not gonna be able to come up with that, but they can't give us that figure because inevitably tuition is gonna continue to skyrocket. I don't know how we curb that. I do know this might be, uh, you know, not set well with some of the state colleges, but state colleges, in my opinion, should take care of our state students. Um, and we need to make sure, I understand that we, we need the revenue, they need the revenue, so they get a lot of out-of-state students that come in, but we need to make sure that South Carolinians who qualify should be able to go to school here and get a job. Now, college is not for everybody. A four-year college is not for everybody. We're going to invest more in technical schools. I, I don't have the number. I would disagree. I, I don't have the numbers to back it up, so we'll just have to, to go with it. But I don't know if Republicans have taken money out of technical schools because that's where our future is going to have to lie. Nursing over at Midlands Tech, there's a wait list for Midlands Tech nursing. We need skilled labor for Continental, for Boeing, for all these companies that we're bringing into South Carolina. And doing that through the technical system is best. I personally like what Governor Haley is looking to do with reforming education funding and setting up very pr different parameters. You will get funded based on the results that we see. And some of those results I already mentioned about some in-state uh, individuals and some people getting some um, jobs and job placement. It is sad that our country, I don't have the exact statistics, so I hate to throw those out, but y'all know it better than anybody. We have college graduates now. You know, I graduated in 92. I'm glad I graduated when I did. I was excited to get a job four months after I was in college. We got college students now who are having to sit there and they have spent all their time on this degree and can't put it to work. We gotta fix that. Ms. Loveday. Representative Ballantyne brought up a really good point with the education lottery and he's right. It, it doesn't go as far as it used to. It's $5,000 for the life scholarship, which is um, the most popular scholarship for students here in South Carolina. So a lot of times it's cheaper for students to go out of state to a school that's cheaper because we are the most expensive state in the SEC minus Vanderbilt. 
and get out-of-state scholarships. Um, because if you go here, you're getting in-state tuition, which again is the highest in the SEC besides Vanderbilt, and $5,000. Um, I share Representative Sellers' um, sediments when, when I write that check every, every month to the student loan corporations. I mean, it's painful. And, and to know that hopefully his, he's on a 10-year plan, but I'm on a 25-year plan, so it's, it's going for a long time. <laughs> it's like a mortgage. Um, or pass a hat here later. But, right, yeah. Um, but the most important thing to remember is that the education that I got um, and that, that numerous students and, and thousands of students in South Carolina are getting every day it, it is the most important thing for us to remember. If our students aren't educated and there aren't jobs out there for them to get, our economy completely tumbles. Um, I, I agree with Representative Sellers that, that we have to make sure that there are jobs out there that no one is going underemployed and that everyone is being employed. Um, and, and the technical training just cannot go without more conversation. We have to make sure that, that the individuals out there, that maybe a four-year degree isn't for them. Um, there are trainings available for them in the nursing programs at Midlands Tech, absolutely. Same with Aiken Tech, has a, has a long waiting list, um, and we need to make sure that our people in South Carolina are being educated, are being trained, um, and then there are jobs for them, because again, we're still 44th in the country. All right, Mr. Moore. Um, yeah, but one problem, we've covered a lot of things here, but I mean, the, the issue we've kind of come to it a little bit is, is tuition inflation, and, and, and we don't stop it. Uh, by around 2030, I think I've seen that the average four-year tuition at a state school will be about $200,000. Uh, and that, that's out of the reach for probably, you guys mentioned the 1%, that's probably out of reach for 99% uh, of American families. Uh, that was never what we intended for our state schools to be, uh, those land-grant universities and other kinds of schools. Uh, and and how, do you, how do you stop inflation? Uh, well, you quit throwing money into endless pits. Uh, I think what we've seen too much SEC, ACC, I'm an ACC guy at Georgia Tech, I admit, uh, is sort of an arms race between schools. Who can build the highest and nicest and prettiest buildings instead of focusing on, we've heard it here on both sides, focusing on outcomes. Uh, and there's, there's much too much focus on who has the prettiest bell tower and the prettiest front yard uh, as opposed to, you know, who's generating those kinds of students that, you know, the Bridgestones and the Boeings need. So uh, we can't keep throwing money, uh, you know, uh, at the problem. All right. Um, I was asked to aim for an ending of 8.15 with the idea that we would actually end by 8.30. So <laughs> instead of following the schedule here and going ahead to uh, closing remarks, I'd like to try to squeeze in a couple more questions if that's okay with everybody here. Sure. Um, Ms. Loveday alluded a little bit earlier to the problem of uh, uh, focusing uh, our lawmakers in the presence of, of money and its influence in, in politics in terms of uh, people making decisions according to who's going to give them money and who's not going to. Um, I'd like to uh, get y'all's thoughts on what can be done about money in politics, what can and should be done. And I want to start with Mr. Ballantyne. Thank you, Brad. I can tell you what can be done because I've done it. Um, and I don't say that in an egotistical manner because it certainly took the, my colleagues, I believe Representative Sellers, well, actually it passed unanimous, so I'm pretty sure he was on board with that. Um, I passed a campaign finance reform law. Uh, it has since been perverted and it caused the complete mess that you see now out there. I was about uh, to say, please it, tell them what that I, campaign I finance you. law has um, caused. That, again, it goes back to I had the bill and they changed it. But nonetheless, <laughs> the meat of that bill, which stayed intact, was opening up the transparency uh, online. Y'all know we file our reports online. Uh, for a while, it used to not be that way. Well, the House and, and uh, Senate started doing it. Well, I figured, look, if House and Senate can do it, let's go ahead and put school board, let's put mayoral, let's put county council. Let's open that up. Let's show where we're getting our money. If y'all want to think that has some kind of impact, if it buys influence or whatever, you'll know. You'll see where Ballantyne gets his money and where he spends his money. Um, one of the things I pushed for, and this was interesting, it, it, I could not get it to go through there, is um, the, the federal government, what they do, uh, there's a blackout period, y'all, in, in campaign finance. So you file a report two weeks, give or take, before the election, and guess what? Surprise, surprise, a lot of money comes into those two weeks, and nobody knows about it until it's over. And so everybody's like, wow, had I known that, I'd do something differently. The federal government has to report those contributions during that time within 24, 48 hours. My bill would have done that. That was stripped out along with some other items. But that's how you do it. You just have to open up the books and let people see where the money flows. All right, Ms. Loveday. Ethics reform is a hot button issue right now. I think every state house and state senate candidate has, has come out with an ethics reform bill that they want to get passed when, when they go in January to the state house. 
Um, but what the problem is, especially here in South Carolina when it comes to, to ethics and, and finance reports, is that there are a lot of kind of secrecies around it. People can have PACs, and then you don't know how, who's giving to you, and it really doesn't matter how it's going out. There's also not a lot of regulation. Um, Representative Harrell right now, um, the Speaker of the House, is in a lot of trouble because he pays himself $30,000, doesn't really say what it's about, say it's for travel expenses, and then when you ask him for more explanation, he talks about how it's a reimbursement for the depreciation of his plane, um, which you would think would not be part of, of, of any ethics law. And then you see Representative, or I'm sorry, Lieutenant Governor Kennard, who is indicted and, and resigns from office because he buys his wife dresses and PlayStations and TVs from his campaign account. And the problem is, is that the, the, the ethics reform in South Carolina, and no offense to, to Representative Ballantyne's bill, because I know that it was changed after written first time, because that's what happens, um, is the fact that there is no oversight. No one is looking out for these people and making sure that they're doing what is right. There's no one out there saying, these people can't give to you, because unfortunately, when uh, the Supreme Court decided to allow anybody to give to anybody and you to get to pay out to anybody, um, it, it stopped us having any type of oversight over our elected officials. Mr. Moore. Um, of course, there, there are two sets of rules the parties play by. Uh, one is the federal, one is the state laws. Uh, we joke that the federal law is like a prison yard with broad, barbed wire, and the state laws are like a pasture with a little, uh, little chicken wire around the side. Uh, our state laws here are pathetic right now in terms of campaign finance. We're the only state right now, Amanda, Amanda and I joke a lot about this, right now the only state nationally that doesn't have to let the political parties report their contributions or expenditures. We do that out of good faith in the public. We fully agree on that. Uh, but next session you're, you're going to see a bipartisan effort, I think, and I hope, I truly hope, that uh, deals with all these issues. Uh, and what it's all about, Representative Ballantyne nailed it perfectly, is transparency. Uh, that as long as you know where it's coming from, uh, then you're, you're informed. Uh, the problem we have right now nationally is these super PACs and all these other secret groups uh, are dumping hundreds of millions of dollars literally uh, on both sides into this election. Uh, the campaign uh, maximum uh, obviously federally is too low, it's $2,500 $2, uh, per cycle. Um, if, you, if you let uh, you know, donors give more than that in some way, shape, or form, uh, but let those only be the donations that can affect federal elections. There'd be a lot more transparency. I think Democrats, for the most part, agree with that. Mr. Sellers. I mean, I, I think this issue has been covered by my colleagues, and I think we have some consensus here. I, I'll just talk about two things really briefly. I don't even think I'll use my full two minutes. But one is Citizens United, um, which blew a complete hole in federal finance laws, campaign finance laws, which gave birth to this theory that corporations are people and that there's this unlimited giving that corporations can do, which is somewhat perverted um, uh, politics as we know it today and, and has given way to super PACs and spending a lot of money from where you don't even know it's, where it's coming from. The other thing that we have here, which is unique in South Carolina, is we have leadership PACs, which I'm pretty sure that uh, Nathan Ballantyne and I would appreciate some oversight to. But now even in leadership PACs, I mean, you don't have to disclose anything. You don't have to disclose where your money comes from. You don't have any limits. There are absolutely no rules. You don't even have to register your leadership pack. You could just put PAC on the end of it and write checks. Um, so I think that there are a lot of things that we can do here in South Carolina which would help answer your question and, and help and, and do the due diligence that I believe our constituents deserve. All right. I'm going to, uh, we're going to start with Ms. Loveday on this one. Um, in 2001, 94,000 of South Carolina seniors received Social Security benefits and 98% were enrolled in Medicare. Under your candidate's plan, what can young South Carolina workers expect for the future of these programs? As a young person, I think that when you're going to vote, a lot of times people say, when it comes to Social Security, Medicare, um, anything of that nature, oh, it doesn't matter to me, I'm so far away from there. Um, but what's so important to young people is that we have to build a retirement. If we don't think about it until we're 40 or 50, it's not going to be there and we're going to have to work until we can't physically can't anymore. Um, and, and there are two completely separate ideas uh, with Governor Romney and with President Obama when it comes to Medicare. Uh, they will tout all day about the $700 million that is cut from Medicare and Obamacare, or the Affordable Care Act. Um, but what is not said, uh, the subtext to that, is that it's cut, cutting subsidies to insurance companies. It's cutting the fat 
out of Medicare, whereas they want to cut $700 million out of Medicare that will actually hurt the pockets of the citizens. And we need to know that when you go out to the ballot, ballot box and you vote for president, that if you want Medicare to be there the way that your parents have it or the way maybe even you have it today, if you want it to stay that way, you have to vote for Barack Obama. Because if you vote for Governor Romney, he and Paul Ryan will make sure to cut it and make sure that it's not, it is not Medicare as we know it. Um, they will start for 55-year-olds. Uh, Marco Rubio was in a commercial in Florida saying that Medicare, I don't care what Medicare is like, I have so long to get there. But what happens to the 55, literally the 55-year-old who's been planning on Medicare his or her entire life, um, and they're going to cut it and change it as we know it. It's not fair to them, it's not fair to the American people, and it's not fair to even young people who have paid into these programs, um, whether it be for five years or two years. They've been promised these programs, they've been paid into these programs, um, and it's so important to know who you're voting for and, and what those programs mean to you, whether you're 20 or whether you're 55. Mr. Moore. Uh, you hear a lot of scare tactics here, obviously, and as Nathan predicted earlier at the beginning. Uh, we're going to throw Graham off a cliff. That couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, what Governor Romney and, and Representative Ryan have both said is that if, if you've paid into the system, uh, you'll get every benefit uh, that you were promised. And that, that's important to the Republican Party and, and Governor Romney and Representative Ryan. Um, what's got to change, though, is taking us off this unsustainable path for those people uh, who are under, let's say, 40 years old. And that's what Representative Ryan's uh, plan for Medicare and Governor Romney uh, want to do. Uh, and, and, you know, there's all, there are all these promises uh, from President Obama and his administration that, you know, Medicare's solvent and, and Social Security are solvent until a certain date, 2030, whatever the number is. Well, no one, no one ever talks about what happens after that. Uh, right now, our federal budget is being eaten up uh, by debt and interest payments and entitlement payments. It's not really a proper word, entitlement payment, but spending on Medicare, uh, health care, and, and Social Security. About 70% of federal spending within the next 10 years will be spent on those things. We, we have got to find a way uh, to save money while also taking care of those, uh, those people uh, who we've made promises to. And that means a, a structured, uh, orderly change for those people who are younger. Uh, and and the, I mean, the running joke my people our age, Amanda and I, I won't, I won't predict uh, any other ages here. Uh, the running joke uh, among us is that, you know, we're planning on our own retirement because we don't, um, and you probably should, we don't, we don't count on Social Security being there. Uh, and and that, that's really kind of a sad place to be. But if you look at where it's going, the train is running out of track. Mr. Sellers. Um, just to correct Mr. Moore briefly, um, Actually, the reason that the deficit is so high, I know you, you and Representative Ballantyne have gotten kind of used to the word entitlement tonight, and I should have stopped you a while ago, but the reason that the deficit is so high now is because of un, uh, wars that were paid on a credit card, not due to quote-unquote entitlements. But to get to your question, um, I think that there's a drastic difference between the plans of both candidates. I think that uh, turning Medicare into a voucher program for all Americans is what Representative Ryan has said that was in his budget. That, he pa that passed the South Carolina House of Representatives that all of our delegation, except for Congressman Clyburn, voted for um, in the House, excuse me, um, is devastating. It's devastating to Medicare. Um, what that will do is that will leave many um, seniors in this country falling into a gap where they won't have the opportunity to get the care that they deserve. Worse yet, they won't have to, the opportunity to get the care that they were promised. Um, we, we've been talking about Social Security and what we understand is that the president has a plan to keep Social Security solvent until 2030. And we understand that we're going to have to continue to do work to make sure that it stays solvent beyond that point. Um, but the uh, Congressional Budget Office has said that um, Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan's plan, it makes, uh, it keeps Social Security solvent until 2016. So, I mean, we're, we're talking about two totally fundamentally just polar opposites in stark contrast. So I think the question, the answer to the question is, um, if you want what was promised to you, um, if you want to be on the right side of history, I think you'll vote for the two individuals who have promised to preserve um, Social Security and who promised to make sure that the Medicare that you pay into, uh, the Medicare that our seniors who have given up, who have fought wars, um, who have retired in many cases, um, who, who, who deserve this, these benefits, I, I think we need to vote for them to make sure that they actually are on the receiving end of those benefits. Ms. Ballantyne. Y'all probably remember earlier tonight I talked about making tough decisions. This is one of those tough decisions. Now we can keep on kicking the can down the road or we can do like we did in South Carolina with Representative Sellers and I and others and made some changes to the retirement system here. Were they popular? No. 
Did they make everybody happy? No, but we tried to keep everybody as close to whole as possible. And I didn't vote for that, so it wasn't a we. Didn't? Okay, no. all right, I won't give him credit. I won't give him credit for closing that billion dollar unfunded mandate there that we just did, but I was trying to help you out, McCarthy. Um, but, but, but here's what I'll tell you, and I go back to back in the days, uh, I can't remember if it was two, three years ago, but when we had a lot of teacher furloughs around. And so I would go and talk at school improvement councils, and I'd go and talk to teachers, and there'd be a group of them just like here. And I'd say, raise your hand if you like furloughs. Nobody raised their hand. Then I said, okay, you, 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 and you aren't coming back next year. You won't have a job. Now raise your hand if you like furloughs. Everybody raised their hand. That's a, that's a, that's a different analogy, but what I'm trying to say is we have to make changes. We have to, we're not going to throw grandma off the cliff. I'm not going to get into all the specifics. We just fundamentally disagree with how we think those programs should run. But are we going to make changes? Yes. Here's one I think the Democrats would agree with. Benefits will grow slower for those that are the most affluent. That goes back to asking them to pay more of their fair share. So if those that can fend for themselves and do the most for themselves might not get as many benefits as they thought, they'll still get benefits. But the greatest impact is on the younger individuals who, quite frankly, you heard Mr. Moore, and, and I don't know if Amanda said it as well, but aren't really banking on it under the current system. If we do not make any changes, it will not be there for future generations. And again, I go back to the selection of Paul Ryan. You heard a lot about him tonight with his plan and what he wants to do and this and the other. I think that was bold of Republicans to say we're serious about entitlement. We're going to have to make some decisions a lot of people might not like, but down the road, future generations, my kids, your grandkids, et cetera, are going to be able to benefit from it instead of it being away. I, Thank you. We, I can't let that One go. Minute. Yeah, I don't even need a minute, but I think both parties <laughs> agree on means testing. Um, but to Representative Valentine's point, I really don't want you furloughing my, 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 my grandparents and my parents' Medicare. I mean, that's the last thing I want you to be able to do. They'll, they'll and, get it. And, and I, I think that they deserve to get it. And I think the people who are 52 deserve to get it. It's not an example of you and you and you and it, do you like furloughs? No. You earned it and you earned it and you earned it and you earned it and you've given so much to this country and paid so many taxes that not only did you earn it, but we're going to make sure you get it. And turning it into a voucher program does not allow that to happen. All right. Let's go to closing remarks. And we're going to go back to our original lineup. Uh, Matt Moore, two minutes. Well, I'm not sure who's undecided here tonight, but uh, uh, to it's, Ohio, it's, it's, it's hard to, to say. Let me, let me look at the camera and speak to Ohio. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, we happen to think if you're undecided, uh, maybe you're not looking hard enough, uh, that, that Mitt Romney and, and Paul Ryan have, have put forward a plan uh, that will lead America uh, back to prosperity and end this malaise on so many different fronts, on the economy, uh, on foreign policy. Uh, and make and help every American uh, get a good paying job and, and a living wage, as Representative Sellers says, uh, that, that Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan uh, have a proven record of leading the kind of uh, states and entities uh, and groups uh, that uh, have been successful. And um, look, I, I just think, uh, like I said earlier, there's a fork in the road here, and uh, four more years of Barack Obama and, and, and Paul and, and and Joe Biden may be too much to overcome, and I, if we reelect him, uh, obviously, uh, it's our president, and I, and I respect the president, but I'm highly concerned uh, going forward. It's love day. I will take Matt's sentiments of being concerned, but obviously I'm concerned in a different situation. We, we need a leader who is respected overseas. We need a leader who believes in our future and in our children, and we need a leader who believes in equal rights. We didn't talk about women tonight, I don't know if that's because I'm the only woman up here, but we don't need a, we don't need a president who hires women because he looks at him through a binder full of women. We don't need a leader who who says that he has women staffers who go home and cook dinner at 5 p.m. And so that's why it's okay to have women staffers because I'll let them go home and cook dinner at 5 p.m. It's 8 p.m. If my husband hasn't eaten, he's going to be hungry. Um, <laughs> We need a, we, the president said it perfectly last night. Uh, we need a leader who is not going to take us back. Uh, Mitt Romney's ideas take us to the 1950s for his social ideas, takes us back to the 1980s for his foreign policy, and takes us back to the 1920s in his economic ideas. And so we need someone who's going to bring us into the future, who knows how to lead a country, who knows how to make sure that the individuals in America are given the, the right to what they've been promised, whether that be Social Security or Medicare, um, or just the, the idea of having a well-paid job. We, know some, we need someone who's going to run the country knowing that the middle class is the number one group of people in this country and not just the 1%. 
the 47 percent that the governor has said and not said and then said again um, are entitled, those are the people who are most likely in this room. I know I'm one of them. And those are the people who run this country. And they are going to be the ones who make sure that our children are educated, make sure our children are fed, and make sure that our children go to college, get good jobs, and, be, and get the American dream that all of us have, have been given and have worked hard towards. Mr. Valentine. You heard my colleague, Representative Sellers, earlier tonight reference uh, Vice President Biden laughing during a debate. You heard uh, Amanda Loveday over there talk about how uh, President Obama has accomplished 50 percent of his jobs. I would tell you and argue that broken promises are nothing to laugh at, and they're certainly not a bump in the road. These are serious times facing our country. President Obama has been given his chance. He had a Democrat Congress for two years. He focused on Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act for my colleagues across the aisle. Instead of focusing on jobs and what matters most, he spent his time cramming down a 2,400-page bill that had, people had to pass to find out what it was about. He's been given his chance. He hasn't done it. He said he cut the deficit in half. It's grown. He said that unemployment would be much lower than it is today. We're about 9 million jobs away from where he said it would be. 9 million jobs away. I'm not saying he's not a good guy, but he's just not fit to be reelected. Before I came over here, I was in my paying job at Wells Fargo Home Mortgage. The custodian was coming around talking to me. I have no idea his political interests, but he knows I'm over here in, the, in, in state politics. He asked me if I watched the debates. I told him I did. I tried to play it in the middle of the road. I didn't want to upset him or anything like that. I had no idea his indication. He said, you know what? I voted for President Obama the first time. I wanted to give him a chance. I'm not going to give him that chance. He doesn't deserve it. I hope many of y'all, maybe not in this room, but across the country, have realized that, look, it's time for new leadership. $16 trillion debt and growing is not where we want our future to go. 47 million people on food stamps is not what America needs. 20-something million people unemployed or underemployed is not good. And most importantly, a weak America overseas is not good for anybody, not just America, but the whole international community. If you haven't made up your mind, I hope you'll vote for my president, and that's Governor Mitt Romney. I wanted him several times ago. This is his chance. In November, get out and vote and make your voice heard. Mr. Sellers. Uh, thank you so much. And I, I think to echo a sentiment, um, given by my, my, my friend and colleague, and I used to sit next to he and then Representative Nikki Haley, and I enjoy both of their friendship and still to this day. But the world needs leadership. Um, and I think that there is no, no other time in our country's history where we have to stand up and be strong and be a beacon of light for the rest of the world to follow. Um, we think about Gaddafi, and we think about ending the war in Iraq, and we think about having a plan to end the war in Afghanistan in 2013. We have a president that believes fundamentally in Israel's security. And you contrast that with six foreign policy speeches and, and working the, the Winter Olympics as the extent of Mitt Romney's um, foreign policy leadership, I think we understand that the world needs Barack Obama. Um, domestically, you talk about 40 plus months straight of job growth. You talk about investments in, in, in infrastructure. You talk about investments in teachers, in firefighters, in police officers. And you talk about the fact that Barack Obama of the last four years has been president of the United States of America. He has been president of a select few. Um, those 47 percent, that hit home. That comment in Boca Raton, that hit home. Because as you all have tried to do today, which I have to continue to debunk, um, those 47 percent, they don't want to hand out. Uh, they simply want to hand up. And all the president has done is tried to make sure that we move this country forward, that we don't go backwards to the eight years we had with George Bush. And we will not let you forget that. I know you want to remember the 100 years we had of Democratic leadership in South Carolina, but we will not let you forget the eight years before Barack Obama. We're on the right path. And the president has done some wonderful things. But he's the first to tell you that our job is not done yet. And I look forward to November 6th, um, re-electing Barack Obama, President of the United States. Thank you. And I'd like to thank the Community Foundation and the library for sponsoring this. And I want to thank our, our lively but well-behaved panel. <laughs> and thank all of you for coming. <laughs>